So today we're going to talk about chapter 12. Uh, like I said last time, the way I put this together, we might get through it all. We might not. Um, and then we'll talk in the channel about uh, whether uh, my Ling's ready for chapter 13 or what's going to happen there. All right. But we also might not get through, and that'd be fine. So yeah, we're talking about unsupervised learning. Um, the things that we I wrote up as learning objectives are we want to compare and contrast supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, we want to perform a principal component analysis to analyze the sources of variant variance in a data set. Uh, we want to impute missing values in a data set via matrix completion. Um, we're going to perform k-means clustering to partition observations into a pre-specified number of clusters, and then perform hierarchical clustering to partition ob observations into a tree-like structure. All right, so first we'll start with what is unsupervised learning. So supervised learning has predictors, or features, and outcomes, and unsupervised learning only has or at least only cares about features. It, it's not fitting things to an outcome. It's just looking at, at your feature space. Uh, your goal is usually to discover interesting things about your data. Um, a lot of times you don't know what you're going to discover. So you might be trying to find ways to visualize your data to understand it better. You might be trying to find subgroups. Um, one thing they don't talk about here is sometimes you're trying to, um, you know, like we go into uh, using it to impute values or to, to like characterize your features, uh, finding what's important in your features, that kind of thing. All right, so we'll start with PCA, principal component analysis. We did previously talk about this in chapter six, and actually a lot of the figures come from chapter six, but here they go into more, um, I don't know, trying to really understand it. Um, and so the, the idea, I don't dive into the math in, these in this presentation because I find the conceptual explanation way more understandable. And then there are functions, um, if, it, if that bothers anyone. And yes, thank you, Jonathan, for turning your head. I'm not showing the whale shark this time, but the, yeah, the, the slide that I included last time is think of this as a school of krill and you are a whale shark trying to eat all the krill. What do you do to eat it? You turn your head so that you are matching that principal component. Um, and so you, you find that uh, axis with the most variance. And we're going to look at this two, uh, two feature data set to really easily abstract what's going on. Um, so to dive into that, that axis is the one that like is the longest axis through all the data, the one that separates the data the most. That's the green line. That's the, um, the pr first principal component. We're going to map everything onto that first principal component and then um, rotate that. So this is the, the axis here, it's the first principal component. And then the second principal component is just um, orthogonal to the first one, basically how far is everything away from that line. Um, first two are really easy to understand. Past, oh, and there can be as many components as there are features. There are as many components as there are features. So here we have two principal components. We're done because there are only two features. But you can kind of picture doing the same thing through like 3D space that you're just finding the axis through all the points that is um, separates the points as much as possible. And then that, you know, that's your pr first principal component. You find a orthogonal axis along that, that is the second most separation. And then from there, you're going into 3D orthogonal. So then you would find like a Z axis that separates what's left the most. Um, and then, you know, it works out to much higher dimensions, um, but it's a lot harder to conceptualize, obviously, the higher you get, but it's the same idea that you're trying to spread out the data or, or find what, like what is causing the spread in the data. Um, all right, and so from here, I just want to dive into the lab to show how to use it, uh, specifically in tidy models. This is almost exactly the same as Emil's uh, tidy models implementation. Um, but I think I changed some variable names uh, and spread some things out differently in how we talk about it. So I'm not going to just jump over to his. So. To do it in tidy models, we're just going to library tidy models and tidyverse. 
Um, through this, I mostly try to namespace everything so we know where it's coming from, but I think it got messy at some point. I stopped doing that. Um, but this is all recipes. Uh, there is a step PCA in recipes. Um, before you do PCA, you probably want to normalize because if you're looking at, you know, you're trying to find where most of the variance is, but if one of your predictors is a big scale, it will appear that the variance is there. So you normalize it first. I'm not familiar with the recipes step PCA, but doesn't it have an option just for doing that? Because that's very common in PCA. Is you, um, you normalize and recenter. I know it doesn't unless Emil led me astray. Um, that's good to know because often you just kind of assume that you're doing PCA on something like you know, there's an option there. Right. That. I'm making sure that I didn't uh, fix that. You can. So there's an options. There's. Uh, center false scale false. Yeah. OK, so there is an options argument where you can send the options to PR comp, which has center and scale as arguments. But they're set to false by default because they don't want you fighting again between multiple steps, I think, is the idea. Um, so the recon recommended pro process would be more explicitly normalize. And I think like the reason for that is so you don't, so it's not hidden. It's not just invisibly normalizing. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, you can actually, there's an options argument that takes a list and that list is the argument, arguments to the base, well, stats, PR comp. Um, and then here, wait, wait, one more question. Does yep. the normalize do the recentering and rescaling? <laughs> I think so. Let's, uh, I'm loading up the help to, these are things I should know, but I don't. So, uh, normalized numeric data to have a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero. Yes. Okay. That's good. Yes. Um, and again, you know, there are ways that you could do different things there, but the, I, most of the time, that's what you want to do is center and scale. So normalize. All right. Um, and once we have that prepped recipe, uh, we can use broom to to pull out uh, component or pieces of that. So first, we're going to look at the co coefficients. I apologize. The font on this came out really small, and I didn't notice until yesterday for some reason. Um, I think I think it was better on my local copy, and then when it when the um, when GitHub knitted it, it got really tiny, but we can mostly see. We're just going to take those coefficients and put them into a ggplot, put the uh, value on the x-axis and the term that's loaded into it on the y-axis, and then look at each component, um, and then as columns and minimal, because I don't like the gray background. Uh, so the basically what we're seeing here is the first PC, uh, first principal component, gets the uh, this this data, sorry, to go back, US arrests, um, where, there we go, is, uh, it's an R built-in data set that has, for each uh, state, it has um, these urban population percentage, uh, the like number of rapes, number of murder, or yeah, the, the rate of per, per 100,000 or per, million something i think it's per per thousand of rape murder and assault um so it's all population normalized already uh why do we use such horrible data sets <laughs> i don't know uh i did yeah i so i thought about you switching out the data set but basically i didn't want to put any more time in and i was going with what uh they used i did have that thought at the start of the whole process is everything's always just awful we don't i don't want to hear about it but in this case so the um the the crime stats are highly correlated and the population urban population less so so the first per principal component loads in those crime stats pretty strongly the second principal component because the urban population wasn't loaded into that one very much loads in mostly the population Oh, one thing that this does point out is sign in components. Um, well, here, I mean, it doesn't matter, but like the whole thing could flip, like, it, and it would mean the same thing of you're strongly loading urban population positively and 
not as much the others. Um, so there's some, uh, it's not exactly randomness, but there's some doesn't matterness <laughs> to the sign. Anyway, third one mostly focuses on rape, and the fourth one mostly focuses on, I guess, assault and murder, the other two. Um, in this case, you can kind of see like it's this one's covering all the crimes. So this one makes up for it and covers urban pop. And then this one mostly covers rape. So this one makes up for it and covers the other crimes. It won't always work out that way. Um, this is kind of a balanced data set. So um, all of the things are varying, I think. Um, anyway, so the, the main focus here is that broom uh, tidy makes it easy to pull stuff out. And then you can easily visualize with ggplot. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing you want to do with uh, principal components is, um, like a lot of times, what you'll do is use it to reduce the number of features that you're dealing with. And often, how you decide how many principal components to, to deal with is how much of the variance do they explain. Um, and so you can pull the variance out of this uh, recipe and uh, I'm filtering for the cumulative cumulative percent variance is one of the factors that's in, in the variance. There's also the just percent variance that's explained by that component. Um, there's the like just a raw number of variance um, and cumulative on that. Uh, so we're going to plot this and here X is our component and Y is our value divided by 100 just to make it pretty. Um, putting in columns, putting a scales percent on that axis and then I threw in a line at 90% just to to have you know a, a, a discussion point basically um, and so we've got the cum cumulative percent that's explained by each component here we've got pc1 two gets up to like almost 90% and then three goes through that 90% so we could keep just those three if we wanted to explain 90% of the variance um, and step PCA has arguments of num number of components, num comp or threshold. So you could say keep two components, or you can say keep as many components as you need to explain 90%, to explain 80%, whatever it is that you care about. Um, maybe you would only want to explain 51%, and so you'd end up with only one PC. Does that make sense? All right. So then they go into this matrix completion thing. Um, I don't know that this would make it into a book that was not authored by the people who wrote the paper that this is all about. Um, but it is an example of how you can use uh, principal components to uh, impute data. Um, it's not even in their slides yet. I thought that was interesting. So um, get we will from that. But the idea is, so sometimes you want to impute data. You want to fill in NAs intelligently um, sometimes that's the whole task. And the example they use is the Netflix challenge where your matrix is what everyone has watched. So you've got like users versus movies. And there are lots and lots of NAs because people haven't watched everything. And your goal is to fill in those NAs with a rating that you would expect them to give to that movie. So based on the ones that they have rated, what rating do you think they will give? Um, and so they uh, they published this technique for using PCA to fill in those NAs. There are lots of other techniques for filling in those NAs. Obviously, it was a big uh, Kaggle challenge, and you know it was a big deal. Um, so we're going to walk through their their technique. All right. Well, actually, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the vague highlights of their technique, and then I'm going to talk about their package that they kind of just mentioned in passing in their lab. I personally feel that they implemented the package so we don't have to be able to implement it ourselves. We can just learn how their package works. So um, what they do is they do just a mean imputation in each column. And they use that filled in matrix to compute PCA data. Um, and then they, which I kind of skipped as a step blending in. And then using those PCA loadings, they fill, they recompute what the missing data would be, and then they repeat that. So they, they recompute new PCAs using the data that they fill in using the previous PCA. Can you elaborate a little bit on step number two? 
Yeah. So, so it's, it's sorry. Um, I, I blended two steps together basically, but so you, you fill in that data and now you've got complete data mm -hmm. and you complete, you compute PCAs, but your complete data is, uh, like it, it basically then you take, you put your NAs back in and you use the other or the loadings to figure out what, like you, you make that value, the NAs more perfect in order to fill in the, uh, in order to get the PCA results that you got, but all the, everything else isn't perfect with that. And so. Um, so one of the parameters here would be like the PCA up to two principal components. Uh, oh, right. Um, yes, I think it was a, they have a cutoff on how many, yes, because there's that, that's part of the speed gain is your, um, I think, <laughs> and, and technically just to, to back up for a sec, they, they they technically use SVD in the lab and in the package, which is singular value decomposition is the mm -hmm. actual function that happens underneath PCA. Um, Anyway, um, I am not able to better explain it than I have, <laughs> so I would encourage you to read the, that part of the book uh, to dive into the math. All right, and so to look at that, um, this lab actually isn't in Emil's uh, section, and um, I started to try to put it into the book, and there isn't really a tidy way to do this. Um, without writing new functions for the tidyverse so or for tidy models so i just used their package and do it outside of tidy um but i it, it's basically like what's in the book but the um or the start, start is but their names are really awful they, i hate the way they name variables so i renamed all their variables um so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with that us arrest again um and to get something to fill in we are going to emit 20 values. We're going to change 20 values to NA. Um, we randomly choose uh, a, a um, I said, omit. oh, right, right. So we randomly chose, there are 50 rows. So we choose 20 of those rows randomly. Um, so and omit. And then in each of those columns, we choose, or in each of those rows, we choose a random column, one through four. Um, and we have replace equals true because we want to be able to rechoose the same column. And then we make a matrix that is just those columns and rows. So it's, you know, in column 37, I want to get rid of, or sorry, in row 37, I want to get rid of column three. In row 47, I want to get rid of column one, et cetera. And then we take the arrest data and just set those things to NA. Um, it so happens that uh, the first two rows actually were chosen in the 20, which made it convenient to, for showing what happens that now we have this matrix with NA is filled in. Um, and then we're going to use this later. So we make a matrix that is basically this, well, it's um, the complete matrix. So it's where are all of the NAs in the original data? That's going to be handy to be able to call things by later. Um, all right. And then we're going to use their soft impute package. Um, the, so they, they do walk through how to do this like step-by-step step in the lab. But two things are, if you actually want to use this, um, I'm showing it with type SVD so that I can match their results. But there's a, another engine that they've developed since the SVD style of doing this. That's basically the same idea, but a little bit uh, updated from there. Um, so you can use their package for that. It also, it's really fast. Um, I played around for a while to see, like in the book, they do use a threshold of where they're cutting, where they stop imputing of um, a change of one to the minus seventh, I think. So like, let's see what it can do. Oh, it's basically instantaneous. So um, this is where it's done. Like it can't get any better. And uh, so we, we do that fit, we use that fit to impute and they have this complete function where you take your um, uh, matrix that has the NAs and the model that you're using to fill it in and it automatically scales. So we need to unscale while we're doing it and we fill it in 
And then what we're doing is looking at the correlation between the ones that we just imputed and the original matrix. And it gets up to 88% correlation, which is pretty good for like, I, I can't, I think from the first step, I should have shown this, it starts somewhere around like 50%. That, I can't work at the math in my head of if that is roughly what you would expect, but it's doing mean imputation to start with. It's basically garbage. And then they take it up to, um, you know, pretty good. I, I, I'd be pretty okay with 88% accuracy and imputation, depending on what I'm trying to do down the road from there. Um, so yeah, that's their, their technique. Again, the book goes into all the math of how it works. Um, I don't, <laughs> so, but you can replicate it using just SVD and you like walk through and like do all the steps. So if you're really interested in how it works, um, you can dive in there. I, I would say, um, I probably want to drill into it more of how it works because I don't think I want to use exactly their technique, but the idea of their technique, um, like finding, you know, mean impute, use that to build a model, use that model to fill stuff in and then do it again uh, is intriguing. And I could see um, more ways to, or different uh, techniques where that would be useful. Um, all right. So now we'll move on to k-means clustering. Um, k-means clustering, it's an algorithm to find groups in your data. Uh, the idea is you, you pick a number of clusters. You, you have to do that. I mean, we're going to see. Imagine you have to do that first. So say I want three clusters. Then you randomly assign every observation in your data set to one of those clusters. You compute the centroid of that cluster. Uh, move those observations to the nearest centroid, so move to a different cluster, and you keep repeating it until it stops changing. I'm going to show what that looks like with this data set. I apologize for the weird axis that I missed when I was cropping the figure. Um, I mean, it's on purpose. It's an axis, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so we got this random data. And you know, eyeballing it, we can kind of see two uh, groups. And maybe there's one here and one here. But let's do something um, systematic. So you start by literally just randomly assigning things into a cluster. Um, there are different variants of k-means that use something other than random assignment to start with, because you can get a slightly different result depending on how you start. Um, but we do that. We compute the centroids. They're going to be close together because it's random. Like, So the in theory, the centroid really should be at the center for each of these if it were like a perfectly distributed data set and perfectly random. Um, and then we reassign each point to whichever centroid it's closest to and uh, move the centroids to the center of those that new collection. And then we repeat until it stops moving. And so in this case, we got a few more greens. Um, so these oranges got uh, moved, but uh, basically, you know, Keep going till it stops changing. Um, something that you have to be aware of is it is not guaranteed to be right to like to find the minimum. These numbers are the distance intercluster distances, and that's what you're trying to minimize so that the distance between these points and these points and these points um, within the clusters is as small as it can be. Here they randomly did it six times and four times hit the same value twice they hit larger values when it, when they were done. Um, and technically, we can't even be certain that these four are the minimum. They're just the minimum that we saw out of these six. Uh, so what you do, and I, I'm going to do it in a middle minute here. Yeah, this is based on Emil's lab. Um, we're going to talk about it that what you do is you do it a bunch of times and find, take the minimum, basically. Take whichever cluster. Uh, has that minimum value. Usually, you know, there are things you can do inside to choose. So, all right. So I'm basing this again on Emil's lab, his tidy models lab. Um, he did two clusters. I thought three was cooler. So I did three. Um, it's easy enough to do. So we're just randomly setting things up where we've got 75 points, um, where we have the, they all have the same mean, uh, sorry, each cluster has, is, um, our norm based on the same mean, and there are 25 in each of these means. 
is what's going on here. Um, or sorry, there are 25 of each mean in our R norm call. Um, and then we do the same thing for Y where we just give three. And again, these three values were um, semi-random, uh, trying to spread things out a little bit. Um, and then, you know, we defined what the clusters are. So we, I, I label that with a true cluster and we can just take that and put it through a ggplot. And these are like the defined clusters. These are, that's the correct answer. Although you can see that the way that I define these, we do end up with two clusters that are pretty close together. Um, and we'll see what happens there. All right. So for k-means, um, I'm getting rid of that true cluster column just to make sure I don't accidentally uh, use it, <laughs> like, because um, that would be bad. And uh, setting a seed uh, so that I can you know, reproduce this. And then we just do k-means on uh, that data frame. Say we want three start centers and um, this end start is how many times are we gonna retry? Um, and so we're gonna, we're telling it, just try it 20 times and give me the minimum. Give me the best clusters out of that 20. Um, one of the best technically. Um, we can use uh, broom again, where we augment the using that fit we augment the original data um, i rename the dot cluster to pred cluster because it makes a prettier thing but whatever um, and then we're going to plot uh, x and y and color it by the prediction um, and whatever point and scale and whatever and if we look at it um, this could be a little annoying to go back and forth but you can see it's the same clusters like those two are the ones that are most likely to be wrong and they're not i uh didn't I, I I was going to uh, play around with try to get the colors to match, but it was um, like things would change as I changed things and it was making a, a headache. So uh, the colors don't match, but it's the it's the same clusters. Um, the other thing we can do is um, easily. So let's we want to um, do this for more than just three. Like we happened to know three was the right answer as far as how the data was generated, but we want to um, have a way to do this where we don't know how many clusters are in our data. The example that we give is we take a tibble of how many clusters, one to 10, um, and then we make a model in each of those rows using that k-means of the uh, uh, xdf. Um, the centers are our k, or the number of centers are, is our k. We're still doing 20 starts each time. And then we're going to use um, glance from broom to pull out the within um, uh, 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 square with, within some of some squares. So the, the distance within each cluster, that's what this top within SS is, um, distance within each cluster. And then we plot that. So we take our multiple k means, put k on our x axis and that uh, distance on our y. and do a point or you know do a geom line what you're looking for is what what they call this elbow so you can see it goes down a lot it goes down a lot and then goes down a little 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 little, little. so three is what we would choose as our correct number of clusters um this isn't always as clear of an elbow and so there can be a judgment call here depending on what you're working with um Sometimes intuition will come, or not intuition, but like knowledge of the data will come into it of, well, you know, it's hard to tell whether four or five makes, or, you know, three or four makes more sense in some data case, but I can imagine three groupings and I can't figure out what the fourth grouping would be. And so you might go with something like that. Um, I think there are techniques you can use to more formally choose a cutoff, but um, depending on what you're doing, those techniques can change and they don't really go into that. Um, so to finalize that, we can take our multi-k means. We just filter for the one that was right. We pull out the model and, and pluck it out. Uh, augment that with uh, the data that we have or use that to augment the data we have. Um, again, I like to rename pred cluster just because it's prettier. Um, and we plot that out. And again, that's just the original plot. Um, but I set this up so we can look at, okay, what would have happened if we chose something wrong? So here I'm choosing two clusters that's not surprising 
like those are if I were given this data and asked to choose two clusters, those are the two clusters I would do by eyeballing. Um, and then I also did five clusters just because it gets kind of um, interesting in that, like, I don't know, not super surprising that it tries to find two clusters in this one that was over here. Uh, in the two clusters that are close together, this green cluster is actually made up of both of them. It's like those two points for sure. We're down in the middle, bottom one. I think those two points were in the bottom one um, because it, you know, we're telling it to do to find uh, separations that aren't really there, or at least not in the way they shouldn't be there. In the way the data was generated, they could randomly be there, um, and that's just to show that it is sensitive to that parameter that you're telling it how how many to do, so it can be wrong. Um, so next, the next technique, and I guess before I move on, any other thoughts or comments or questions about k-means? All right. All right, I think we're gonna make it through. So next, we do hierarchical clustering. Um, hierarchical clustering, other than being kind of hard to pronounce, is basically uh, clusters of clusters of clusters. You're making a tree, a hierarchy. Um, to start with, technically what you do is you say each point is its own cluster. Um, you do that so that the vocabulary becomes easier because then what you do is at every step, you assign the two closest clusters into a shared cluster. So out of all your clusters, um, including the clusters that have already been combined, what are the two closest ones? We'll get into what does closest mean in a minute. Um, you repeat that and you're done when everything is in one cluster. So you just keep combining clusters until you've got one cluster. Technically, you can stop before you have one cluster, and there are um, different techniques to choose where to cut off. Uh, but the the like complete clustering, oh, that's the wrong word to use. But the um, if you go all the way, you get it to a single cluster. The reason that's what I don't want to use the word complete is there are types of linkage that you can use to decide how to um, assign clusters together. The first one is called complete linkage. That's where you take the distance between each pair of clusters, every point, every pair of points in a given pair of clusters, and whatever distance is the longest, that is the distance you use for clustering. Um, I don't think I put in visuals for this like I should have, but it, you know, the general idea is that's the the longest for complete. Single, you do the same process except you take the smallest distance. So if part of a cluster is close to another cluster, you say those are a shared, those get combined into a shared cluster. You can also do average, um, which I thought was interesting that they stuck with the word average uh, describing this in the book, you know, mean presumably, but you technically could do other um, uh, definitions of center, I guess. Um, or you can just take the centroid of each cluster and the distance between those centroids, which won't, uh, always be exactly the same as the average distance. Um, uh, and then that distance. So all of those are using distance, but you can use Euclidean distance as the distance. You can use correlation between the points as the distance. Um, you could use other distance measures. You could use uh, Manhattan distance. Um, I, don't, I don't know that if cosine similarity would make sense for clustering, but you could presumably try it. Um, so there are other distance measures. That's a whole other uh, topic that they don't really go into. Um, all right, so I didn't I didn't do any changes to Emil's lab because uh, it's good. <laughs> and so we're just gonna look at Emil's lab for this. All right. Um, so we're using the H clust function. That's another uh, base R function um, and and dist, uh, which takes your matrix and, like calculates all those distances. Um, we're telling it to use the complete or the average or the single. Um, and that's the idea there. Um, he uses this facto extra package um, for visualization. Uh, and so we just take that, you know, like the complete cluster, for example, we tell it what type of, um, uh, what was the word, uh, linkage what type of linkage that we're using and how many, um, or where we wanna uh, cut off, like how we how we want to set, end up separating them. So we do still have this K that we can provide um, depending on how we're using the hierarch hierarchical clustering. Um, 
but you can change it. Like you can use the same clustering and say, well, okay, no, now now choose where I've got three, and it would. Um, it's basically where do you cut off in the tree? Um, you would have this one and this one and this one as your three. Or you could say I want four. And you go down and you would take this cluster and this cluster and this cluster and this cluster. Um, something I didn't talk about is the height on this tree is like those distance measurements are the height. And so if you just draw a line at the height, that is how far apart you're limiting your, your breakage to be where you choose where your clusters are. Um, and so, yeah, we can look at, uh, it's hard to compare. I guess that would have been a nice thing to do in the notes, but um, using these different linkages, you can see the, like if you kind of just look at just this break here, you can see that it's totally different um, depending on the, the linkage uh, definition. And then likewise, <laughs> if we use single, um, it makes a cluster of one thing and then a cluster of everything else um, because that's the difference distance, the shortest distance between things. Um, this one thing happens to be a little bit further off. Um, so uh, what what is this next thing that he does? I can't remember now. Uh, but so, oh, um, we aren't scaling by default. We might want to do that, uh, depending on what we're doing. It, it can make sense because again, the difference in, um, you know, weight versus age, the difference can be way bigger depending on the units you're using. So you might want to scale your, uh, your differences. And that again, will result in like completely different clusters. Um, you can look at the correlation between your um, your different clusters. And so he uses this proxy distance function with correlation as the method to supply a different distance. And I guess that's something to kind of stop and um, point out that, you know, we are telling it what our distance metric is by this distance function that is just creating a matrix of all the distances. We can do uh, any different distance function. This proxy package um, it has like an extensible distance calculator. So uh, it's got method and we can see that the method um, is defaults Euclidean, um, we can say that we want a uh, correlation with it, but there is, if you go through the help for this, you can define your own methods and you can do any sort of distance measurement that you come up with, um, which there are a lot of different ways that people measure distance. And so whatever, you can use this proxy dist to create that and then cluster. Um, and that's the idea. So there are two other labs that are different PCA and a different clustering on like real world data sets. But um, because they're real world, I found them, it, it's, it creates things that are much less uh, understandable in a teaching kind or a learning context. Like, you know, okay, um, we're gonna get these clusters. Uh, this is the fitted PCs and where, sorry, this is the, the PCA breakdown and what what is what and where what does everything mean? We do see kind of a real elbow, and that is useful that you can kind of see. Um, oh, sorry, we didn't even look at this, but you can sometimes use that elbow method to decide how many principal components you want, but you can see even more so here. Well, would I cut out here where there's only a tiny change? But oh, okay, there continues to be some change. And depending what you're doing, you might change your method of cutoff. Um, again, cumulative variance explained uh, <laughs> is pretty continuous across the uh, the the uh, PCs. So it, it's interesting on this that there isn't an easy cutoff on this. A lot of the time here, you would probably just say, okay, I've, I've explained, you know, 95% of the variability. I don't need those last few PCA or PCs, or maybe you only want to explain 75% or whatever. Um, and then the clustering, like he, this is this is all fine. There are figures in the book that, I guess, if you work in gene clustering a lot, they make sense. I used to do ELISA's all the time, and the figures that they show did not like. I couldn't see what they were trying to show me in them, um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, I am not repeating those from the book, but they they show. 
um, you do, you know, you can use these clustering techniques to find families of genes, uh, which is useful because, um, you know, it's used in cancer diagnosis and cancer treatments change based on which cluster you're in. Um, and so that's a, you know, it's an important technique. Um, I don't think there's anything else that's really super interesting in this lab to me. Uh, I will, you know, I encourage everyone to go through the labs. I did go through them. I don't remember getting much out of these last two. So, um, yeah. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Because that's the chapter. I don't think I have any more notes. Yeah. So a chapter in 40 minutes. <laughs> nice job. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I do recommend uh, Emil's labs, you know, go through them. And, and actually the original lab for the um, the uh, matrix completion, if you want to really dive into how the math works on that, 